to talk about the international trade barrier. So keep following. And today I will propose several questions for you. So perhaps we will have two discussions. The first session, we will talk about like the, should we really need the international trade? And also think about like if one company, maybe they cannot join this kind of trade, what will happen? And then I will give you more like the different discussion. So, Okay, so basically think about the international trade uh, barrier. I think it's good for like the protect some domestic company to fight with the international famous with the large economic scale company. But the key question is for how long and which company should one country really protect? So think about that. So, once you really think about this issue, you can go back to look back to your home country to see which industry should they really need to take care of. For example, like in Hualien, maybe the tourism industry would be the most important, one of the most important industries. What else? Semiconductor, maybe. I don't know, automobile, or like the, um, maybe giant for bicycle or electric bicycle. Um, or like the other car sharing system. So even for recently, the recently we also talk about like the automation, automation car, automation bus, automation driving, and we also think about maybe next year we will launch a new auto driving bus system around our campus. So key question is should we really need to protect with like in most like the common sense thing like the yes we should you do really need this kind of protection. Is that true or not? Yeah, we, we, I have to give you a video and talk about the debate. See what's going on. And, okay, so let's, let's do the first video. Episode 34. We saw that the practice of free trade according to comparative advantage meant lower buying prices, higher selling prices, and greater global production, all of which means improved living standards. Do you know how many countries in the world are engaged in trade? Every single one. There's not one country in the world that's completely self-reliant. And do you know how many countries in the world practice completely free trade? None. Not one single country practices trade free of any restrictions. So if free trade is so fabulous, then why do all countries put restrictions in place? Perhaps it's best to take one step. Okay, so first question, shoot. I think most of you may learn the economics. So most of the economics may talk about like the two debates. Should we need, really need to do a regulation or not? So one, um, one major trend I like, talk about, like, we should let the trade go free everywhere. So compete with each other without any regulation and the restriction. It's the one. Uh, but here in like, a video told you like, that there is almost any anywhere. Like, like, most of the country will try to put a different regulation, different tax, different tariff and to, to protect the different industries. So in this video, try to talk about that. Step backwards and ask, who has the power to put trade restrictions in place? That would be each country's government. Why would the government put such restrictions in place? The government places trade restrictions in order to protect domestic industries from foreign competitors. Now ask yourself this, which domestic producers would seek such protection? Surely not all of them. Some domestic producers already have a natural advantage in production over the foreign competitors. This is the key. The only domestic producers who would need protection 
are those who will be driven out of business under free trade, those who have a comparative disadvantage in production. So what arguments could weak, disadvantaged producers make to the government to convince it to provide protection in the form of trade restrictions? Well, there are several. First, there's the domestic jobs argument. If some type of trade restriction, say a tax or a quota, is placed on income and foreign goods, then consumers will have to purchase domestic goods instead, right? And if the demand for domestic goods is higher, then the need for workers to produce those goods is higher. Okay, so first debate. Is that true? Let me put it back. Do you have some income? Goods, then consumers will have to purchase. Okay, so like, like if you put more international trade to protect the domestic area, domestic industry, and will you really appreciate with that? I mean, think about that. Maybe iPhone will be a good example because we have an iPhone 12 will launch nearly soon, and maybe some country will try to put lots of protection. So will you really appreciate that you just ignore the iPhone because it's too expensive and try to purchase the domestic brand? You can think about that. Some countries may be fine. So for example, like the South Korea, maybe they will highly support with the Samsung. And for the mainland China, they may support to the Huawei. But different countries may have a different culture. So this may not really work. So this is the first debate. Even though you put lots of barrier, maybe still not help. Domestic goods instead, right? And if the demand for domestic goods is higher, then the need for workers to produce those goods is higher. What if the U.S. steel industry? With protections in place, more U.S. steel is purchased and more U.S. steel workers have jobs. The domestic jobs argument is pretty persuasive with politicians because voters with jobs are happy voters. Here's the rub, though. While trade barriers mean more jobs in the protected industry, they actually cost jobs in other industries. Think again about the U.S. steel industry. Historically, taxes, called tariffs, have been imposed on imported steel, so the U.S. producers don't have to compete at such a low price. But this means that steel will cost more to the consumer. Who buys steel? The auto industry, perhaps? Construction firms? Steel drum manufacturers? Any industry that uses steel as a resource will face rising costs, which will lead to decreased supply, which means fewer jobs in all. Okay, so this is kind of chain uh, impact. So number one, maybe you protect, so they, they, the, the entire price still there. I mean, the cost still very high, extremely high. So consumer may not be able to purchase the, the relatively cheaper uh, pr product. But think about that. Uh, automobile. Later on, we will also talk about the automobile automobile industry. Like the, the still, the price is very high, so maybe the consumer are willing are not willing to pay for this high price. If you lift this kind of restriction, maybe your consumer, I mean domestic consumer, can easily to get very cheaper from international brand. So it's kind of one another debate, so which means the economic will be still slow down. That's the second debate. Well, those industries. So while steel workers may have more jobs, workers in all the downstream industries, like auto workers and construction workers, will lose jobs. On net, especially in a country like the United States, where disadvantaged areas tend to be low raw materials or low end materials, this will result in a net loss of jobs. Argument for protection number two, level playing field. The logic here is that the foreign producer has some unfair advantage of the domestic producer, and the trade restriction would just even things up a bit. An unfair advantage might be if, say, the foreign producer was receiving subsidies from its own government, such that costs were reduced and foreign producers' product could be sold. And so far, it's true. I mean, for example, like the South Korea, they were highly support with their domestic brand to fight with in the international different countries, like the Samsung, like the Kia Motor, like the uh, several, even for the previous marine time industry. So some country will try their best to support their, their brand to, to in the international field. But some are not. I mean, so not every brand have this kind of subsidy. So this is one question. Well, very cheaply in our market. But what happens if the foreign producer just has 
an advantage. Are all advantages unfair? In 1997, the collapse of the Thai baht kicked off a wholesale financial collapse in Southeast Asia. As Asian currencies lost most of their value, becoming very cheap, Asian products became cheap. Suddenly, U.S. steel producers were facing extremely cheap Asian steel and went to the U.S. government to seek protection. The question I have is this. Did the Asian producers have an unfair advantage? Did they deliberately plan for their currencies to lose over 90% of their value just so they could sell more steel? The term fair is a slippery thing, somewhat subject to interpretation. The other difficulty here is that one country may dispute the fairness of another's restrictions and retaliate with restrictions of its own, eventually escalating into a trade war. A third argument for trade restrictions is that they can raise additional revenue for the domestic government. A tariff, or tax on imported goods, will generate added dollars, as would revenue from the sale of quota licenses. But in a country like the U.S., where only a very small percentage of government revenue comes from traded goods, remember we saw in the budget episode about 90% of federal revenues come from income tax, payroll tax, and corporate tax. Does it make sense to harm consumers by making imported goods more expensive? The government revenue argument is likely to be more compelling for governments of poor nations where there isn't much income to tax. The only place to squeeze additional revenue is from businesses, especially internationally. A fourth argument used in favor of trade restrictions is the national defense argument. If an industry is critical to the national defense, we should protect it in peacetime to make sure that it's still around in times of war. Some industries may spring to mind immediately as being critical to the national defense. Tanks, guns, munitions, aircraft, shipbuilding. But then what about the metal used in all of these industries? Shouldn't that be protected? What about our food supply or uniforms for our troops? Or the producers who make buttons for the uniforms? You can see where this is headed. It becomes difficult to draw a hard and fast line separating industries that are critical to the national defense from those that are not. This becomes compounded when you realize that in recent years, the argument has been broadened from critical to the national defense to critical to the national interest. For example, some countries have restricted the amount of U.S. entertainment and publications, like movies and magazines, that are allowed in because they feel it would not be in their country's national interest to allow their own cultural identities to be swallowed up by it's a little bit longer, but almost finished. And just quickly, they have five debates. So just clearly think like the, later time we have another case we need to discuss like the, about a new NAFTA deal. So when you finish these five debates, later time you think about like why they, Canada and Mexico will allow the United States to sign a new NAFTA deal, and what happened. So just let you think these five debates, and they were related to the following discussions. By U.S. pop culture. The infant industry argument is number five on our list. This says we should protect and support new industries until they're mature enough to compete on their own. I can understand this. In the town where I grew up, there was an economic incubator. If you had an idea for a new business, you could put in a proposal. If you were successful, you'd start up your business in the incubator building, enjoying lower rent and immediate access to business consultants. After a designated period of time, your business would move out and someone else would move in. Here's the drawback with federal support for a new industry. Who is in the best position to know when the industry is ready to leave the nest? The industry is. So if the government goes to the industry and says, hey, you ready yet? Can we take the restrictions away? What's the industry going to say? Sure, go ahead. More likely, the response will be, no, not yet. Ask us again in a couple of years. In the past, some countries would protect these infant industries for decades. In the U.S., at least, the International Trade Commission, or ITC, places time limits on protection and usually weans the industry off by progressively decreasing the level of restrictions over that time period. There is one more method that goes against the natural flow of free trade, but it's less about protecting a weak domestic producer from foreign competition than it is about giving your domestic producer an artificial boost into other countries' markets by subsidizing them so they can take over market share abroad. This method of creating international dominance is, of course, squarely in the arena of unfair advantage, see argument number two, and is really an open invitation for other countries to retaliate against you with restrictions of their own. In this episode, I went over many reasons why a government might agree to protect the economic interests of its domestic producers. Okay, so later, 
even though they have comparative disadvantage with the restrictions of their own. In more detail, how the government can protect domestic... Okay, remember this five, because number six is similar to number two. And later on, we will talk about a new NAFTA deal. Think about uh, this five. So number one, talk about uh, domestic jobs. Number two, uh, they will play field, they have some subsidies. Number three is government can have a revenue, tax, incur more tax. Number four, maybe national can get some more interest. And number five, they can help develop a new industry. Just remember this five. Uh, later on, we will be back. I will do this. But now I would like to share something. This time that new, but keep debate again. Two years ago, um, uh, maybe not stop on two years ago. Fifteen years ago, they signed a, a NAFTA deal, which means that Mexico, United States, and uh, Canada, they have the one like the international trade barrier. But starting from two years ago, President Trump decided to renew this new deal. And two major industries was being harmed in this new NAFTA deal. One in Canada, you can see the video, another one in Mexico. So then they will ask you why then in Canada and Mexico finally agree with this new deal. What happened if they do not agree? What's, what's going on? I mean, so just let you think about first, and later we will be back. So very soon it's just one minute, but you can see two kind of the industry has been harmed for here. United States reached a NAFTA deal just hours before the midnight deadline as negotiators frantically worked against the clock to come up with an agreement. The new agreement will no longer be called NAFTA. It will be called the United States Mexico Canada Agreement, replacing the name. And tonight on a call, senior U.S. officials said that they consider it a major victory for the Trump administration. They also think it's a good deal for Canada and for the United States. Departing his office tonight, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said he thinks it's a good deal for Canada. We're expecting to hear more from the Canadian government tomorrow about this, but for now, here's what we know about the deal. Canada conceded some on dairy, giving increased access to the market for American farmers. That was the number one demand that President Donald Trump was making. In exchange, Canada gets to keep Chapter 19, the dispute settlement mechanism, something the Canadian government believed was vital. As for those steel and aluminum tariffs, they'll be dealt with in a side agreement. It's unclear exactly how that will unfold, but senior U.S. officials tonight seem confident that it, in fact, could be resolved. We'll have more details on the deal tomorrow, but obviously huge news here tonight. There is a new NAFTA with a new name with all sides, a new victory. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, Ottawa. Okay, so you see the first industry has been impacted here. It's dairy industry in Canada. So milk or like a cheese or something will be involved here. This first industry will be impacted in the new NAFTA deal. The second one will be automobile manufacturing industry in Mexico. So let's see what's going on here. Um, this is a little bit interesting video, but you can see what's going on. And also think about the first video, because they also talk about the some debate there. So here, OK. This is a 1993 Chevy Suburban. And this is a 2018 Chevy Suburban. The 1993 one cost $21,000 brand new. And the 2018 one cost $47,000. But if we adjust the price for inflation, the 1993 Suburban would cost $42,000 today. Even though the 2018 model comes with modern features like a backup camera, remote engine start, and, you know, airbags, the cost hasn't changed much in 25 years. It's not just the Suburban. The average price of new cars has risen only 7% since the early 90s, while the price for almost all other goods has increased by 86%. And that is thanks to NAFTA. The nations of North America are ready, strengthened by the explosion of growth and trade, to recognize that there is no turning back from the world of today and tomorrow. When the North American Free Trade Agreement took effect in 1994, it was the first major trade deal of its kind. The U.S., Canada, and Mexico agreed to eliminate tariffs, which are taxes on most imported and exported goods. The countries hoped it would increase investments and that by strengthening Mexico's economy, it would slow illegal immigration. The trade agreement benefited the auto industry in particular. It allowed automakers to keep costs down, 
because cars and auto parts could be traded for free? Well, for the most part. If at least 62.5% of a car's parts were sourced from North America, it would be tariff-free. Cars that didn't meet the requirements or were made overseas would be slapped with a 2.5% tariff. NAFTA also gave automakers the ability to source cars where costs were lowest. By comparison, a car made in Mexico costs $1,200 less than one built in the U.S. because labor and parts are cheaper. As an industry, we've kind of performed some economic miracles when it comes to keeping cars affordable by being able to source some of those 30,000 parts from you know, the least expensive places. Let's take this model of a 2014 Ford Mustang, for example. Its engine was built in the U.S., but its manual transmission came from Mexico. It's impossible for a consumer to easily find out where each individual part came from, but it's likely that the doors were molded in Canada, the speedometer came from Germany or China, which was assembled in the U.S., but then sent to Canada to be installed into the dashboard. The seatbelts did come from a company in Japan, but the seats were probably made in Mexico. The tires most likely came from South Korea. In the end, the 2014 Mustang was built in Detroit, but with only 65% of its total parts sourced from North America. It made the tariff cut. And Ford is in no way the only company who does this. About three quarters of the cars sold in the US meet the standards to avoid tariffs including most cars produced by the top four auto brands. The U.S. is actually producing more cars now than before NAFTA. Same for Mexico and Canada. But you would- so This is very important, you see, like after signing the NAFTA, they start to develop, develop the like automobile industry. Except this, what happened here? Crisis. Yeah, financial crisis global. So you can see from the 2008 to 2010, a little bit shut down, but after that, still back to the normal. Mm -hmm. But you can see, like, after signing this new agreement, and this NAFTA agreement on 1994, they do really develop three automobile industry in three different countries. Okay? So this is a benefit from us. But know that if you listen to politicians. NAFTA was a mistake. The single worst trade deal ever made by any country anywhere in the world. Instead of creating jobs, NAFTA costs such jobs. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. Remember the first video. Do they really create the jobs or, you know, to, or reduce the jobs or the job loss? So think about that. Later on, we'll have a debate later. <laughs> In the auto industry alone, a third of U.S. auto manufacturing jobs have disappeared since NAFTA was signed, as the same types of jobs have grown in Mexico. Oh, sorry. So, when we look at this, disappeared since NAFTA was signed. As okay. So look at this table. You will see like the, after the previous NAFTA, United States lose lots of jobs here. Instead of like Mexico having the more jobs in there. So, what happened? I remember Ava yesterday we talked about like, different cities, different locations, and have a different labor cost. So this is what happened here. The Mexico have the lower hourly pay compared to the United States. So, and also they are quite close and share with the same international trade barrier. So which means most of the manufacturer will move the factories to the Mexico not stay in the United States. So you will see that's why President Trump want to renew the whole new NAFTA deal. But let's see the results. As the same types of jobs have grown in Mexico. But in reality, that may have less to do with NAFTA and more to do with automation. Researchers have found that fewer than 5% of US jobs lost from sizable layoffs can be blamed on trade with Mexico. But the timing of these manufacturing layoffs in lots of different industries. Maybe it's easy to point the finger at NAFTA. So while most Americans think the trade deal was good for the US, those that feel they were directly affected are passionately against it. And this opposition is why President Trump is following through on a campaign promise. A brand new deal to terminate and replace NAFTA called US MCA, it sort of just works, MCA. But this isn't much of a new deal. 
While it's essentially a rebranding of NAFTA, it does make one major change to the auto industry. Because it would require cars be made with 75% North American sourced parts. And that 40 to 45% of those parts must be made by workers who earn at least $16 an hour. Okay, this is the important thing. So, two things. Number one, they, re, they, they uh, President Trump wish to increase like the parts you have to source in the United States from uh, 65% to 75%. And also, not to is like the manufacturing, the hourly pay must be more than 60 hours. $30 per hour. So before that, give me, let me give you like the one that you want more information. Here, okay. What kind of information reveal in this slide? Minimum wage in the United States from across the different states. So I don't know how much of you familiar with the United States states, but actually it's like I'm quite familiar with this part. Because the universal narrowness and the White House is around as here. And New York City around here, Boston here, California, Texas. So you can you can observe like the they have a different hourly pay and average, the minimum wage requirement for hourly. So California may be higher, New York today also, but all others may be around five to seven. Now new NAFTA requires like a Maintain at least per hourly pay at the sixteen dollars. <coughs> like an almost double. Remember that. So it's quite different impact. And also in Mexico. So you see this is just minimum wage in the United States. How about Mexico? Just keeping your so you can guess. Later, of course later on, you after you watch the video, you can go back to check you from your smartphone. Um, on average, like the minimum wage in Mexico is quite low compared to the United Standards. So if new NAFTA requests, most of the manufacturers should maintain this standard. What will happen? Do the factory will still stay in Mexico or move back to the United States? But Mexico also needs to increase in the level of this kind of standard of the salary. Because it's a new NAFTA deal. Cool. So think about that. So you will see like the lowest part should need to earn like this sixteen dollars per hour. Now at least forty six and as many as hundred and twenty five car models sold today that aren't taxed under NAFTA wouldn't qualify under the proposed US MCA regulations. Our twenty fourteen Mustang likely wouldn't meet the new requirements. So if it is implemented, auto manufacturers will have to decide to just pay the 2.5% tariff or change how they manufacture their cars sold in North America, even if it increases production costs. What looks small on paper, when you think about the complexity and how many parts are on every car, it starts getting out of hand fast. Prices of those cars could go up anywhere from $470 to $2,200 in the U.S. And at these higher prices, roughly 60,000 to 150,000 fewer cars would be sold in the U.S. each year. That would mean job losses. I don't want to see our companies leave and fire our workers. Those days are over. But the U.S. MCA could actually incentivize car companies to leave North America. NAFTA made U.S. car companies more competitive with the global market, and even attracted foreign car companies to build in North America. And if those cars are going to face higher costs of manufacturing and tariffs, their production might get moved to China or other countries. Building a car with thousands of parts is an incredibly complicated process. So while NAFTA has kept cars pretty cheap to produce, the US MCA could change that. And consumers will likely be the ones to pay the price. Okay, so again, like the old new NAFTA request to maintain uh, this kind of standard, but in practice, it's very difficult to implement because most of factory may not be able to allow the workers suddenly increase like this two times in the United States or five times in the Mexico with this kind of new standard. So so far, eventually you see like the maybe they will decide we just pay two for two point five percentage tariff. I mean that'll be fine. Then they can avoid those kind of regulation. You see, 
So that's an interesting debate. So my question will be, okay. All right, so my question will be really difficult today because like the, first of all, I need to two group. One maybe talk about Canada's case, about the dairy industry. Another group will talk about the automobile manufacturing industry in Mexico. And you can Google some information from your smartphone because you may need to talk, to get those kind of information. But my question will be number one, why Canada and Mexico eventually decide to sign a new NAFTA deal. You know, this new NAFTA deal is significantly impact the dairy industry in Canada and the automobile manufacturing industry in Mexico, respectively. So why they decide to sign that? Sign that? What happened? If they do not support this new NAFTA, what kind of thing will lose? So that's the background information I need to check. So group one is to talk about this, group two will talk about the Mexico case. Number two, the video just reveals information here is new NAFTA may be not so powerful. So how will you expect if you try to evaluate this new NAFTA deal? Will you suggest to keep this new NAFTA or back to the NAFTA? Okay, that's two of my questions today. I need to group, so one group, to so talk about Canada in the dairy industry. If you are highly interested in this industry, maybe you can join the first group. Second group, talk about Mexico, automobile manufacturing industry. So question one would be, what kind of situation, why those two governments eventually decide to sign a new NAFTA? Apparently, it's not like good and supportive for their, their um, to, to these industries. And number two, what you think should we Really, I mean, maybe you can assume you are standing on the United States viewpoints or Canada or Mexico viewpoints, doesn't matter. But think about that. Do you think which one is better, new NAFTA or old NAFTA? New NAFTA may call it USMCA. Which one you think really good for those three countries, among those three countries? Okay, I need two group leaders. Um, let me check again. We have my home Let me see. We in this course, certainly yesterday we have some other two later, but in this course I remember previously we have the candy and B, right? I forgot, is that correct? And who has been nominated to the leader before in this course? Oh, okay, Daisy and Handy. All right, so today anyone here who wants to lead the candidate? All right, randomly pick up one. 